thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank the Institute of International and European Affairs for inviting me here today. It is a great pleasure. I will try to take you through the Sour Forest project, and hopefully, at the end of that presentation, we will share some of my great project for what opportunities the Sour Forest project opens up. Um, I can explain the Sarah Forest project for you in, in um, one sentence. Perfect. Um, the Sarah Forest project is an integrated set of technologies for sustainably <coughs> producing food, water, and energy in desert regions. That is perhaps an explanation that raises a couple of additional questions. So I'll spend some time on that. And I'll try to start by explaining why we started the Sarah Forest Project. And I'll start with a very familiar picture. I think it's safe to say that it was a defining moment in human history when we were able to see the Earth from space. This picture so clearly shows us both our potential and our limitations. I am a guy that likes uh, graphs and numbers, so I translate this into a pie chart. This is also a way to see the Earth. And we can see very clearly why it is called the blue uh, planet. Almost 80% of the surface is covered by water. Very little of it is fresh water. So this constitutes the framework for all our activities. And this is what we have to work with in a world that is going to grow in the human population towards more than 9 billion people in 2050. These more than 9 billion people will need food. And it's said that between, we need to double our food production between 70 and 100% towards 2050. That will be quite a challenge within this little part of the pie chart. And it's not the only challenge. These are current global mega trends towards 2050. And uh, these challenges they, they, they are really big, but luckily there are a lot of great people, great institutions, governments, companies addressing these questions. They work very hard, and I'm sure they come up with a lot of exciting solutions. However, it's far fewer who addresses these challenges as a whole. Because these challenges, they are in no way independent of each other. If we are going to grow a lot of cereal for, to, to make food, we need to use water. About 70% of the, all the water we use goes to agriculture. And when we see that graph for the water scarcity, that, that's challenging. And we could add to that the growth of arid areas, the effects of climate change, and the picture becomes pretty, pretty complicated. So it's, it's clear. When we develop solutions, they cannot come at the expense of another challenge. We believe trends can be turned. And it won't happen by launching more doomsday prophecies. It won't happen by looking away. But it will happen through looking holistically at our challenges to applying innovation and through hard work. To use uh, the words of a man that was a catalyst for many great changes, Albert Einstein, we cannot solve problems by applying the same kind of thinking we used when we create them. So that's why we propose to rethink the way we use our resources and rethink the way we produce our goods. The traditional extractive use of resources, it has brought tremendous growth, but it had also uh, been accompanied by some environmental and social challenges. And about 20 years ago, the concept of sustainability started to gain a lot of support. 
It's an important concept. But in some areas, um, it will not be enough. In some areas, we will need to have a restorative use of resources where we bring more into an area than what we take out. Traditionally, when we produce our goods, that's a pretty linear process. We take some resources, we manufacture some goods, and we end up with some waste <coughs> products. We think it's time to close those loops. What is waste from one resource, no, from one production, that could easily be resource for another production. This picture is, in fact, a conclusion from one of our latest studies and it shows the Sahara Forest Project uh, setup. Uh, I don't expect you to go into all the details of this, but you can see that all the processes are interlinked. I will come back to that uh, in a minute. So when you integrate all the technologies, you get the potential for synergies and for increased efficiencies. Based on this thinking, we have proposed the concept of restorative growth. It's a pretty ambitious target. We have defined it as revegetation and creation of green jobs through profitable production of food, water, biofuels, and electricity. In other words, it needs to be good for the environment, it needs to be good for people, and it needs to have a long-term financial viability. The combination of that message with our technological uh, concept has created a lot of attention and we have used that attention to build networks and partnerships. Some of them are listed here uh, below. Also, this has caught quite some attention at the political scene. And that support has been very valuable for us when we are going to try to develop a concept into something on the ground. So now let's move on to the bolts and nuts of the Sahara Forest Project. This is the core concept. It's about putting together existing environmental technologies in a new way and to explore the synergies that arise from that. So we have the saltwater greenhouses. I'll come back to them in a bit more detail, but basically they use saltwater as a basis to produce conventional crops. You have concentrated solar power. It is a combination of technologies that uses reflective surfaces that, uh, he, that take sun rays and points them at a fluid that's heated and drives a conventional steam turbine. And it is different technologies and techniques for soil reclamination and creating vegetation outside. I'll come back to uh, all of these in a minute, but let me just emphasize that principle behind this is taking what we have enough of, salt water, CO2, desert, sunlight, to produce what we need more of, food, water, and energy. OK, now it, it becomes a bit more technical, but I want to include this to so, show you how we use an innovative approach to tackle these challenges. So having a greenhouse in a desert, that needs to cope with several challenges. First of all, as I'm sure you all know, in the desert it's pretty hot and it's pretty dry most of the time. But it can also become rather cold and humid, both at night and in winter. So to sustain a good growing condition in the desert, we had to address uh, three solutions. The basic of this is that the air is coming in at one side of the greenhouse. It goes through a pad, it's cooled, and humidified, and it's let out again. Mm. 
when this hot air comes into the greenhouse, it emits a pad with salt water running over it. And then the same thing happens as when clouds form from the oceans every day. Fresh water uh, um, evaporates of it. So you get a cooling and you get a humidifying process. So the air that goes into the greenhouse is both cooler and more humid. However, at night, you might want to take that humidity down and you might want to heat it. For that, we use bitterns or uh, magnesium chloride, which we take from the seawater. That very, very uh, rich solution of magnesium chloride is poured over the same pads. It takes out some of the moisture and it releases energy. And third, we have the condensing of fresh water. That happens because we have a double layer roof uh, on these greenhouses. We use waste heat from other parts of the CSP, uh, CFP system. We, uh, and then we use that to make that humid hot air go into that roof void. The surface is cold because it's at night and you get condensation of fresh water. How much you get is, is dependent on location. In, in Qatar, you would typically get like two liters per square meter. That's enough for uh, having some crops. You can add more water by traditional desalinization if you want to maximize the yields. So, outside vegetation. In many desalinization processes, they end up with a brine. We do as well from the greenhouses. When we have circulated that salt water sometimes in the greenhouse systems, it becomes too salt to use there. We could let that into the ocean, but we don't want to do that, both because it can create uh, some environmental problems, but also because we want to use that water to run it over hedges outside of the greenhouse. It it's the same process. It goes over these pads, the wind blows through it, it's a bit cooler, it's a bit more humid, and it gives some shelter. And together with soil reclamation techniques, it's possible then to establish vegetation there. Eventually, uh, that brine will become too concentrated. Then we take it out, we put it in traditional salt ponds, and make salt as a normal commercial product. The picture you see below there is from tests that we did in Qatar last year. I must say it was one of my more fulfilling moments in the Sahara Forest Project when I was able to stand on one side of these hedges and feel that it actually was considerably cooler than on the other side. It was about 5 to 7 degrees cooler. And the third component, the concentrated solar power. I won't go into much technical detail on this one. I'll just say that CSP has the potential for rapid and large-scale renewable energy production. However, CSP is more efficient with water cooling. With water cooling, you can increase efficiency with 4 to 9 percent. Also, you need some water to wash the mirrors as the dust settles on them. And the dust in the air, that reflects some of the sunlight back, so it, it's, you want to take that away. So then you end up with a question. You want to put the CSP plants where it's most sunlight. Many of these places, it's rather dry. So how do you supply the water to these areas? Well, we believe the answer is found in the synergies. And this is really the heart of the Sarah Forest project. So let's start with how the greenhouses benefits from the concentrated solar power facilities. These CSP facilities, they create a considerable amount of waste heat. We can use that waste heat to produce fresh water from the salt water. Also, a fraction of the energy coming from the CSP facilities will be used to run the greenhouses, the fans, the computer, and the electrical equipment. The CSP uh, facilities 
they benefit uh, from the greenhouse as they need to take away that waste heat. So you can take away the costly cooling towers of a CSP facility and replace it with the greenhouses. In addition, the hedges and the vegetation and the structures that will stabilize the, uh, the ground and reduce the amount of dust in the air. And finally, you have the outside vegetation benefiting from the greenhouses and saltwater infrastructure as they create a humid, sheltered, vegetation conductive climates. So, if that was uh, much information in a short amount of time, I'll, I'll sum it up. It's all about creating a salt water value chain, really. So first, you establish a pipeline with salt water into a desert. It can go pretty far inland, uh, but our challenges come when it's too high. So we can't go too high because of the pumping costs. You then establish the greenhouses, you establish uh, the hedges, and you get some vegetation, and you introduce the CSP facility. When this happens, you have found a way to establish a saltwater pipeline and a saltwater infrastructure into a desert. And that opens up for a whole new range of possibilities. I mentioned one of them before, the salt production. It's, of course, also to do, uh, possible to do a lot of exciting things with the waste biomass that such a facility would produce. We have looked a lot at how to integrate algae facilities into this. When you have these areas in a desert environment, quite far from, from the sea, that becomes a very interesting option for the algae industry. And finally, um, these facilities will not be viable if they do not interact with the local communities. They need to produce goods. They also need to provide knowledge transfer and jobs. Okay, so that was a bit about the technical system. Where are we on that long and thorny road from a concept to a reality? Um, we presented the first feasibility study of the Sarah Forest project at the climate negotiations in Copenhagen in 2009. That created quite a lot of attention. And in 2010, we established the Sarah Forest project uh, as a foundation and we uh, uh, refined both the concept and the different technological uh, components of it. In 2010, we also uh, established uh, several networks. That was uh, further developed in 2011 when we went into several agreements with industrial players. And we also initiated uh, comprehensive feasibility studies both in Jordan and Qatar. In 2011, we have completed these studies and we are now building the first pilot facility of the Zara Forest project in Qatar. So we have two projects uh, under execution that I will talk a little bit about. We have the project in Jordan. That was first uh, presented to His Majesty King Abdullah II in 2010. He was rather fascinated and he invited us to Jordan to meet with a number of his ministers. That ended up with uh, uh, agreements with the local authorities in Jordan in the area that borders to the Red Sea. So the Norwegian authorities, they committed to fund our studies in Jordan, while the authorities in Jordan, they set aside 20 hectares in the Aqaba region for a test and demonstration center and 200 hectares for potential uh, large-scale uh, rollout later. We now have concluded the feasibility studies in Jordan. We had a high-level seminar in Jordan about a month ago. More than 60 people from 12 different countries contributed to these studies. And uh, based on these studies, we put forward a 
proposal for a test and demonstration center in Aqaba. This is proposed as an innovation and training center. So it's thought to be a bridge for interacting both with Jordanian academia and business and international players. Also, it will be providing training to local farmers. So what you see here is an illustration of the full proposed center. It contains all the major components of the Sarah Forest Project facility. And we are now working to put together a coalition with the support both from Jordan and from Norway, put together a coalition uh, of interested parties to realize this in Aqaba. Our project in Qatar, that started with an agreement with Yara, which is the world's biggest producer of fertilizers, and Kafku, which is a Qatarian company. It's the world's largest single site producer of urea. Uh, we agreed to conduct feasibility studies in Qatar together. And part of that agreement was also that Yara would develop their most environmentally friendly fertilizer to date and a fertilizer for desert areas. In February, we signed an agreement with Yara and Kafko with the presence of uh, the Norwegian Prime Minister and the Prime Minister of Qatar for building the first pilot facility in Qatar this year. We have now entered into the construction phase what you see there on the, on the right-hand hand side is, is the first elements of the greenhouse arriving on site. So it's, it's a rather exciting time for us now. And as I mentioned, this facility is scheduled to be operational in December this year. And that is uh, at the same time as the climate negotiations will be held in Doha about 30 minutes away uh, in December. This is what it will look like. It will contain uh, Qatar's first facility for concentrated solar power. It will contain, uh, of course, the saltwater-based greenhouses. It will contain the evaporative hedges, where we will experiment with both local and more traditional plants. It will contain an area for cultivation of halophytes. That is a group of plants that are uh, adapted to salty conditions. Many of them are rather rich in energy content. It will be uh, salt ponds, it will be PV facilities, and it will be uh, Qatar and the region's largest facility for cultivation of algae. But uh, we are not in this just to build pilots. When we are developing the Sahara Forest project further, we are doing it uh, with these three uh, tools. A test demonstration center is what I talked about in Jordan. It's a center where we wish to create innovation and knowledge transfer. It's the Oasis project, the big commercial rollout project. And it's the farming communities where we see a lot of different independent uh, actors around a shared infrastructure. And to make this happen, we work with both the believers and with the big industrial players with experience on how to get these things on the ground. So as you see, we, we have set out to make some pretty uh, large impacts. And if you're assuming now that we build 10 large CSP, CFP uh, facilities spanning about 3,000 hectares, we would get the 300 of hectares of greenhouse producing 140,000 tons of tomatoes each year. It would produce 370 gigawatt hours of electricity. It would employ about 5,000 people, supporting perhaps 25,000. And you would get 2,250 hectares of vegetation. And now comes the really good part. This is a desert area. If you establish vegetation in a desert area, you are storing carbon. 
You're storing carbon in the roots and you're storing carbon in the vegetation. So this system as a whole has a potential to store more carbon than it releases. It's, of course, great fun to play around with these numbers and scenarios, but our biggest success factor is if we are going to be able to interact with local communities. So we are spending a lot of time, both in Qatar, but especially in Jordan, talking with local farmers, with Bedouin communities, about what, 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 what do they want from the Sahara Forest Project? How do they want us to set this up? And I think from that dialogue, it's, it's clear that it's four things that we really can offer, except from the goods. It's a knowledge transfer. SFP will build training centers where local people are trained in agriculture, in greenhouse operations, in CSP operations. Uh, it's employment, of course. The SFP facilities, they provide both high-skilled and low-skilled uh, options. It's, of course, as a tool, again, in fighting climate change. And it is, last but not least, in conflict reduction. Water, energy, and food security, they are global challenges, but they hit the developing countries the hardest. Since the early days of concept development in the Sahara Forest Project, a lot has happened in a short amount of time. Today, we remain more confident than ever that the Sahara Forest Project has a real potential for making a difference and a potential for creating restorative growth. Thank you so much. <laughs>